Hello, everyone, and welcome to our August tutorial of the VROC Initium One Plus Maintenance Responsibility. In today's live maintenance tutorial, we will review key maintenance and troubleshooting steps to ensure continuous operation of your VROC Initium One Plus automated viscometer. Today's tutorial is hosted by Dr. Stacy Elliott, as well as Marina Jaj and Marina received her Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her main role at RioSense is working with our customers in their sample testing. Dr. Elliott obtained her extensive experience and rheological knowledge through her education at Carnegie Mellon University in Princeton, as well as her experience at both Alcon and DuPont. For today's tutorial, we do encourage you to ask questions as we go through, as we'll be answering questions as they're received so that we can tailor content to today's attendees. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Cece and Marina. Okay, thank you, Eden, and welcome in everybody. So as Eden mentioned, this is gonna be one of our demonstration type tutorials, and it's focusing on you know, what is your responsibility as the user of the Initium to make sure that it's functioning properly so that you can get the best data that you can. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to do, we're going to go over, you know, our basically routine that internally all the scientists and engineers at RioSense um, go through on the regular to make sure everything is functioning and then to address, you know, any situation or as early as possible. So this is kind of, you know, how we come in you know, when we start the day and start, uh, start our procedure to before we do any testing. So um, Marina is going to start. This is Stacy, by the way. Um, we're kind of out of view because the focus today is going to be on the instrument and what needs to be done here. Um, so with that in mind, you may not see us most of the time. Uh, so Marina is going to then start uh, discussing, you know, when she comes in in the morning, getting ready to do experiments, what, what is the first thing the first uh, details that she goes through. Hi everyone. So I'm gonna run through what I normally do when I come in in the morning before I start my testing. So the first thing I check is my waste bottle, which I know you guys can't see, but it's underneath the table. Uh, you guys just wanna make sure it's not full because we don't want anything to spill over. So you don't wanna come to a mess in the morning. Um, the next thing I usually check is my waste bottle, and not my waste bottle, I'm sorry, my reagent bottles over here. I always check to make sure that they're full and that they're properly connected. And then if they're not full, I will usually take them off. Uh, the way I usually take them off is I release the gas first, like this, to make sure there's no gas left in the line. Oh, I don't know if you guys can hear that, but there's a little gas left. So you wanna wait for all the gas to be released. And then you would take out the liquid one. And you can go ahead and replace your bottle. Uh, one thing I do want to note about these bottles is the caps do deform over time, this cap right here. So make sure when you're opening and closing it, you're not closing it like, I guess I would describe it like Superman. So you don't want to close it as tight as you physically can. Um, I know that varies from person to person because um, these do deform over time and then eventually you will have to replace them sooner if uh, it doesn't tighten as well. So we'll go ahead and put this back. When you're putting the bottle back, it doesn't really matter which line you put in first. You just want to make sure that the gas line is in the gas hole and the liquid one is in the liquid one. And you can tell the liquid one is which line that is due to the filter you have in there. I'm going to tighten those. Cool. Another thing I like to check is I like to make sure that there isn't any excess like liquid from the back and cleaning of the syringe here. Um, if there is some excess liquid, it could be that the piston is loose um, and also you just make a mess and we don't like messes. Uh, another thing I like to check as well is make sure there isn't any liquid around the ports here, the cleaning ports, um, that also could be indicated of something that needs to be changed or fixed um, uh, with the ports. Let's see. Another thing I like to do as well is when I come in, I like to open the, under the hood over here and I wanna make sure that my syringe is dry and empty and that there isn't any liquid in it. Um, that could be indicative of a few other maintenance issues which we can discuss later on. So I wanna make sure the syringe is dry and I wanna make sure the line on the chip is dry. Let's see. So 
our chips do have two lines here. You just want to make sure this clear chip, uh, clear tubing is uh, completely dry. Um, there might be some other liquid in the tubings that are connected to the chips. That's okay, but you just want to make sure that this clear uh, tubing is nice and dry before you use it. And then after you check that, you want to make sure everything's closed as such. And if everything looks good, then we could start looking at our diagnostics and testing uh, page here. So another thing I like to check is when this is our Initium software. Um, there's some indicators here. Like the first thing we will check is the use counts. Since it's highlighted. There we go. Yeah. So these are the use counts for some of the common things that we ourselves can change, and which some of them we will show you today. Um, if they are highlighted yellow, that means they're getting close to needing to be changed. So on this software, it's saying our piston here for our auto sampler is getting close to like its like end of life use. Um, so we need to be a little cautious of that. Everything else is not highlighted, so those are good. Um, if something needed to be changed, it would be highlighted red. Um, and usually that means you'd want to take that piece out and test it to make sure if it's not working, you need to replace it. Um, or if it's still good, then it's fine to use. We will come back to this in a bit. And, oh. But just to be cautious, it's you know it's best um, you know because we kind of have optimized the use counts. It's once it goes red, it, it probably is best to just go ahead and swap it out, even if you think you can get a little time, because you don't want to you know um, run into a situation where you do have a failure and then lose sample or, or data. So. So another thing we will check here that we can see from the software is this red over here. These are from our reagent bottles that we have connected to the unit. Um, the reason why these ones are red is because the bottles aren't touching the sensor. We have larger bottles on this instrument, and so they do not fit into the sensors that are built into the Initium. Uh, and because the bottles are larger, we also have to put it on like a platform of sorts. So the sensors are covered by the platform. So therefore it's not reading anything. So that's why we have these red values here. Um, and because of that, it's even more important to double check your solvent bottles to make sure that they are full and ready to use before you start testing. So once all that is good, we are going to go through kind of the diagnostic testing today. Um, the diagnostics will run before you start your test automatically, but we thought today we would go through them with everyone so they get a better idea of how they work. So to get those, if you do want to do them on your own, you go to settings, service utilities, and you're going to click this diagnostic testing tab, and then the screen will pop up. So. The first diagnostic test we do is our chip test. So I'm just going to hit run chip test. And this test is just double checking the sensors to make sure they're receiving proper counts and that they're working correctly. So let's see. Um, yeah, so this is where you would get your first warning if perhaps one of the sensors had failed or been blown out due to overpressure, although that's generally not likely on the Initium due to the um, safeguards that are in place to prevent that. But, you know, they can fail over time as they age. Um, so this would be the first uh, place to look uh, for a, a failed sensor. Um, if you see a count that is significantly reduced from the, the reference values, if it's off by maybe 100 out of the 9,000 or so, that's not um, significant. But, you know, if it drops to 6,000, uh, something on, on that order, then that's a sign that you're going to have some trouble. Um, and then that will be actually verified in the coming up diagnostic tests that are on the um, tabs that we're going to go over next. So once uh, once our chip test is good and our sensors look okay, we will go to our leak test. Okay, so we have both of them checked, so we will run both. So for the leak test, um, you'll notice we have the, the top one, which is referring to the syringe cell injection port. This is mainly looking for any um, leakage of the ejection ports uh, here. So, is the and we'll talk about you know what might be happening here if this is failing. Um, but 
you know, this is the main thing we're looking for in that first leak test is this injection port cover seating properly. Um, and there's an O-ring in here, which we'll talk about when we're uh, discussing changing out your consumable parts. Um, so that's mainly what we're looking at here. That's what we're checking. Um, and then the second one, uh, the one below here is the solvent bottles. So as Marina just explained, there's a lot of opportunity for leaking over here with all of the tubing connections and the caps. Um, so, you know, you need to check to make sure that these are pressure icing properly so you have the correct flow during all of the cleaning processes. Um, so that's the second one that we're looking for. And, you know, so in terms of troubleshooting, if you do have uh, any sort of failures, um, we'll, we'll talk about the injection port in a minute. It could be the O-ring, which we'll talk about when we change the consumables, or once we get to this other tab on our uh, initial diagnostics, um, you know, there's a way to maybe just sort of reseat this uh, injection port cover to, to make sure everything's okay. And then in terms of the failure of the solvent bottles, you know, you want to make sure everything is tightened, particularly if you just recently um, filled up your bottles prior to getting started, or if you've had your caps for an extended period of time, you know, of beyond a year, then, you know, you may need to consider replacing those. And um, because over time, as Marina said, they do age and they will sort of unscrew themselves um, and cause leakage. Okay, so we're, everything is good with us. We're not leaking anywhere, so everything's good. So the next one we're gonna move to is the flow tests. And so we do two of these. Um, and what we're really looking for is, you know, is, is there any obstructions in the flow path? And that means from the test syringe through the switch valves into the flow channel um, to the reservoir and then also a path that takes you to the waste. So this, we're looking for any obstructions here and you know, what everyone knows that you could get them in the flow channel in the microfluidics, um, but we, we could have, you know, there's some other popular places where um, things can get stuck if, you know, you have buildup of protein or um, any other type of solution where you could have buildup of, you know, a residue. Uh, that would be the peak tubing coming out of the test syringe and the peak tubing uh, entering the flow channel. Also, um, this kind of, both of these tests are, will confirm that your switch valves are um, moving to the proper position, you know, when they need to, and switch valves can also get clogged, so it's making sure that they're, they're functioning as well. So that's kind of, you know, making sure everything is flowing in all the necessary paths. And, you know, another thing is if you have multiple chips and you do swap them out, this will also, you know, help you detect if you know, all of the fittings are tightened. So um, hopefully you can see this because we don't have the camera view right now, but uh, so that in the chip, if, if you replace it, you have to tighten these um, fittings on the inlet and outlet tubing. And sometimes if they don't seat properly or they're not tightened fully, then we can have failure on the flow test as well. Um, and as Marina said, normally this is automatically done and you always do this after you press run but we're doing it through the diagnostic testing so you can kind of see um, what the outcome looks like. So the reservoir cell waste test is um, taking us through this path uh, and it's sort of a reverse flow. Um, and so that's going to confirm that we get flow through the chip and flow through certain positions of switch valves, um, both one and two. So the next one will be moving through the syringe cell waste path. So now we're going to make sure there's nothing plugging up um, peak tubing coming out of the test syringe and then the alternate, alternate positions of the switch valves. Okay, so everything looks good. Um, and then we'll do one sort of final thing here on the diagnostics. Uh, we'll go to what's referred to as the low level tab. So a couple things I wanna point out. Um, one is that, uh, you know, just to get comfortable when you're troubleshooting, you know, you know even if things are okay now, um, to get some sort of baseline if you're ever troubleshooting switch valves, it's probably beneficial to sort of force them to switch both valves one and two, just so you can hear what a you know healthy functional switch valve sounds like 
So if you are suspecting, you know, if one of your flow tests, for example, fails and you suspect maybe one of the switch valves isn't switching properly or there's, if it's clogged, um, you can go here and sort of force it to switch. And oftentimes this is a good clear indicator that something has gone wrong and it's really time to um, replace those. The other thing here um, that I want to point out is the uh, test syringe position, or I'm sorry, no, the injection port position. So if you are failing the one leak test that's looking for leakage at the injection port cover, um, what you can do is sort of open and close it uh, from here. And in that case, and you, you'll also need to do this, which we'll talk about more in a moment, to change out your O-ring. But you know, sometimes it just doesn't seat properly at some point, and opening and closing it a couple times will you know, reestablish that positioning. And so you know, that can help um, oftentimes when you're trying to deal with uh, identifying the leak failure there. OK. So that is uh, the diagnostics. And um, so now I think we're going to move on back to uh, you know, what can you change and what, you know, will you need uh, help from a field service representative? So one of the, you know, just a quick review, one of the improvements that we had with the um, Initium Model 1 Plus versus the original is that, um, you know, we, there's some more uh, self-sufficiency and not necessarily so much need for the field service engineers to come. Um, so there are some things that you still do need them to do but we'll kind of go through um, all the things that you can do and what you then need to contact the field service for. So, um, so the first ones up here are the O-rings. So there are actually O-rings, and unfortunately I should have left open the injection port. So we'll go back to low level, open up our injection port cover, we'll leave it open and go back to use count. Okay, so we have two O-rings, those are the top uh, on the chart there, there's an O-ring here in the injection port cover. And to swap this out, this is something, this is a part that you can purchase from us and you'll be warned when it's you know aging and then once it needs to be replaced when that uh, block goes red. And it's just a matter of using your fingernail or maybe a spatula to pull it off and then take the new one and pop it in. And to get it fully seated after you put the new one on, You'll want to go back to that that low level tab in the diagnostics section and then close open and close the injection port cover a couple of times to basically force that back in proper position the second o-ring um, and hopefully you can see here is in the wash port and so it's a larger o-ring around the the base here where we do the inside of the syringe cleaning um, and to change this one it's just a matter of uh i've already just to make things fast so you didn't have to watch us um, deal with all the screws. There are four screws here that um, keep this wash port base in place. Once you take those out, you can pull this out and you can change the O-ring here. So just, again, it's just a matter of pulling it out and then fitting it back onto this uh, adapter here. So that's quite straightforward. Um, and while we're sort of talking about the wash port, sort of an aside, if you're doing the aqueous cleaning, which uses buffer as the primary solvent, buffers have salts of various sorts, and over time they can build up a little bit around the wash port area. This generally doesn't cause a big problem in terms of functioning of the unit, but you know, while you're changing out the O-ring and maybe it periodically you'll want to sort of wipe that down, just salt buildup that you can probably see here. Um, so because we're actually going to demonstrate changing of the syringes, the test and auto sampler syringe, um, I'm going to switch for a moment to uh, switch valves. So um, switch valves, those are something that you will need support from our field service engineers in terms of changing out when it's necessary. But one of the advantages and improvements we made for One Plus over Model 1 is that these switch valves have been redesigned so that they do last longer. And so the chances of them actually failing uh, in a short term is, is quite low. And the way our preventative maintenance goes now is that at the annual preventative maintenance, even if the switch valves haven't reached their maximum um, use count, they'll be swapped out automatically so that there's little opportunity for these to fail um, 
in comparison to perhaps the previous instrument um, because of the redesign and the just consistent replacement at the annual PM. So it's important to have the annual preventive maintenance visit so that these things can be taken care of before they actually do fail. And in terms of the injection port spring, um, this again is something that you will need field service representative to come on site and help you with because it's going to be removing the housing of the unit and dismantling this injection port cover. So that's probably uh, beyond what you'd want to do on your own. So now back to uh, test syringe because we are going to sort of do some demonstration on how to, to handle that yourself. I just want to point out that we have two different um, parts to replace. One is the barrel of the syringe, so that's the glass barrel, and the other is the piston. So the use count on the barrel, because it's glass, it's more durable, it's, it you know, holds up for a longer period of time, is higher than the use count on the piston. So the pistons will expire before the barrels do, because the tip of the piston is a, um, I believe it's Teflon, uh, PTFE. Um, so it is quite durable, but over time it will uh, loosen in the barrel and you know, cause some issues in terms of testing um, and function. And that's particularly true, I just want to sort of a side fact, if you do a lot of uh, temperature sweeps over the full range of the instrument, say from 4 to 70, like cycling over that range over and over again, if that's a test that you do routinely, then you might want to keep a closer eye on the, the piston and the, particularly the tip of the piston as it can deform um, more rapidly over time. And, um, and just another sort of aside, uh, Marina had mentioned, you know, when she comes in to get a test going, she'll look to see if there's any flooding behind the test syringe. Um, because sometimes when the, these start to get old um, and, you know, the piston is loose in the barrel, sometimes we can have excess fluid coming out during the backside cleaning portion of the cleaning protocol. And you can see some, you know, flooding um, back here. So that's another indicator for um, getting things swapped out. So now I'm going to step aside, and Marina is going to talk about how easy it is and what tools you need, which you know so should be supplied to you for taking out the the test syringe piston. Um, and one of the things that we'll follow up with is anytime you change either the piston or the hole or the barrel or both you will need to go and do a uh, calibration of this test syringe so that you, all the positioning is appropriate during testing and loading. Um, and we'll cover that too, so that you understand how that goes. All right. So first, I'm going to show you guys how to change this the test syringe here. So there is a screw here that we'll need to get off first. I like to get that off first. There isn't really an order you need to go through. I guess more of a preference. Check what tool I need. Just while Marina is doing that, I just wanted to point out that it would be good to get sort of familiarize yourself. Um, so when you get a new piston barrel combination and you feel how tightly fitting that piston is in the barrel for a new um, test syringe piston combination, um, get a feel for that and compare it to one that you know you're changing out because it has expired. So you can see how dramatically they can age over time and why it is important to keep up with this maintenance activity um, so that you do have you know, the best data possible. And try not to, again, you know, Marina had mentioned earlier that sometimes people tighten things very aggressively. This screw on the, the piston for the test syringe is one of the things that can easily be over tightened. And it can be cut quite a challenge if you, once you do strip that that screw there to actually get it undone. I ask it nicely. Like, <laughs> Come on. So I guess some of the lab users here are quite uh, a little more stronger than I am. Heavy handed with the yes. screw. All right. So we're going to have someone else come in and try to unscrew this very quickly. I'm having a little difficulty getting it off. Guess I have to work out a little more. That's fine. 
And I guess also I'll point out that, um, you know, when you do have to make the, the uh, swap out for the piston or syringe, um, it's probably a good idea to kind of clean off that, uh, periodically clean off this region. Because sometimes, you know, part of the reason the screw can kind of get uh, stuck there is with the backside cleaning and you have the salts, um, you know, from the buffer, they can kind of build up a little bit and then make it a little difficult to get off. Okay, I think what we'll do then is while we're trying to work with this, we're going to switch over to the um, auto sampler syringe and show you sort of how to manage that. And then we'll, we'll come back to the test syringe. So, well, we'll work it out. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to go back to, so now we're going to talk about, you know, we'll come back to the test syringe, but we're going to do the auto sampler syringe. And um, so the way you would, do this in terms of swapping it out. The easiest way is to go back to your settings tab and the service utilities and go to calibrate auto sampler. Um, so we're not going to calibrate the auto sampler, um, but what we're going to do is select um, wizard mode syringe exchange. And so then this is just basically, it steps you through what you need to do to take this syringe in and out. And it will actually also move the auto sampler um, forward to a convenient position um, for you to do that. All right. I'll try to move the camera a little bit so you guys can see what I'm doing here. All right. Okay. So in order to take the auto sampler syringe out, there's two things we have to move kind of out of the way so we can loosen it. So the first is this little lever right here want to slide to the side and then the next one is this piece up here so you want to make it parallel to the floor and it should just this part should slide out sometimes it goes back this lever and you want to be careful to pull the syringe needle straight out and then since we got it out we're going to check the piston uh, so for the piston you want to make sure there's some friction when you move it in and out of the barrel so a good uh, kind of way to practice this is if you have like a new barrel and piston, you want to try to feel how that feels first. It should feel very like hard to push through. Um, and then you could like come back to your one that you're currently using and check that to see if it feels kind of the same. Um, you don't want it too loose because um, this uh, if it is too loose, you won't drop as much sample as you need and you won't load as much. Um, and this is critical if you have lower uh, sample volumes that you're running. So. I'm just going to pull it out. I'm not going to pull it out all the way, just enough, and then I'm going to slide it through. Okay, just a, a quick comment. Um, they shouldn't, they generally don't fail prematurely, but you know, there's sometimes you do get a lemon, so to speak. So if you are having issues with a uh, sudden drop in loaded volume or perhaps um, unusual bubbles that are being loaded, then that could be a sign that there's an issue with either the um, piston, you know, failing or aging, or perhaps, um, you know, just like other parts of the system, if you're dealing with a lot of difficult proteins or antibodies, you know, sometimes, you know, you could get build up there as well. So, you know, th this is kind of a common place to look if you are seeing some issues with floating, uh, particularly low volume or bubbles introduced into the test range. Yeah. Okay. So I checked this piston and I approve of it. So I am going to put it back. Um, what I like to do first is I like to make sure I put the needle back in first. Um, there's two holes that line up here. I'm not sure if you guys can see that um, with this guard here and this down here. So what I like to do first is I like to make sure those are lined up and that the needle goes through both of them before I slip the rest in. It looks lined up, but it looks like it won't go in unless I open this piece here. And then I'll make sure like this top part of the barrel is aligned with the little like gap that it has in here to fit in. And then I will try to put this 
put these in. And all these things do adjust if you need to move it a bit. All right, so it looks like that'll go in the hole so I can put this in oh, or I'll do that. Let's take a little practice to get that in. And so I'm putting this back to parallel so I can put the top in. There we go. <laughs> That's normal. It'll make that noise. You're a little heavy handed. Um, yeah, that'll um, resolve itself once you complete the exchange wizard. It'll reposition. You don't have to worry. You don't have to do it. It'll take care of it. So. Always lined up. Okay. I think I need to make sure this is pushed down all the way. It is okay. So um, I guess maybe uh, we didn't emphasize enough at the beginning, but uh, while Marina is getting that back into place, if you have questions already, you don't need to wait until the end of the webinar. You can go ahead and start typing those in. Um, and then that way we can take care of those now. We have that uh, box open, so we're watching that. So go ahead and ask now if you're ready. There we go. And then I'm just double checking that the needle will go through the guard at the bottom. If you do move this guard, make sure you use two fingers. Let's see if that slided through, perfect. And then to tighten this, you just put it slightly sideways. Then to get this piece out, to hold the barrel in place, you want to pull it out a little bit and then slide it to the side. There we are. Okay, so yeah, if, if you don't remember everything that Marina just did, um, you'll notice if you use this wizard, it basically points out, highlights every piece that you need to um, rotate to reposition that syringe back in place. Uh, so then we step through this, and the next step is, of course, to um, make sure you you pinch this, and it's basically pinching the, the plunger and the plunger uh, block there that gets the piston in the right place. Um, so that again, this is you know if you've replaced your uh, test syringe and or your piston, and you you know immediately afterwards you know have floating issues, then you might want to come back and repeat this step because sometimes you know, not, you know, doing this properly can be uh, an issue for loading, even if you have a brand new component. And it's generally not necessary um, to re redo this um, Z calibration. So you can skip this, uh, just a quick, uh, discussion on this, generally um, just changing out because of the, the way the you know seating of this is fixed. So when you change this out, you generally don't have to do this Z calibration. The calibration of the auto sampler, including the Z is generally only necessary if you've had to take off the whole auto sampler um, to move the instrument or to have some kind of repair. So generally just swapping out the syringe or the piston won't require any re recalibration of the auto sampler. So we can just go ahead and um, finish this off. And we can exit. And so you notice that even though, you know, while that was happening, we kind of pushed on the auto sampler a bit, 
it uh, regrouped and it found its home there. So let's get back to oops. There we go. It'll re. Uh, this will also happen whenever you do any sort of calibration off that screen. It'll kind of close the software and then reopen it and it'll reinitialize the auto sampler. So let's um, go back then to the test syringe. Um, so let me I'll move the camera so that we, now that we've finished the auto sampler so we can get back to the test syringe. And I will give it one more try to get our screw out. Hopefully it's not stripped, but I figured that maybe it is. Yeah, I think, yeah, okay. I think it's been, been stripped there, so I need some pliers to get it out. But fortunately, um, because we have so many units in our lab, I pulled out a test syringe from the one behind me, which you can't see. Um, and so in terms of connecting this, it's quite straightforward. We'd want to go ahead and go back to that low level tab to open up the, um, let me just do that, mm -hmm. open up the injection port cover. And then you would want to, use the tool that comes with uh, your kit to remove the screw, um, which holds the piston on the block here. And then there's another tool um, that is also included because just like your chip, there's a fitting here on the tip of the connector here for the test syringe that um, will connect into the switch valve. So it's just a matter of loosening this connector and then removing the screw from the block in the back here. And if you're just changing out the piston, then you can just pull it out and remove and put the new one in, remove it and put the new one in. And um, you want to be careful when you're putting in the brand new ones because they are very, very tight. So you kind of want to gently push it in so that you don't bend that uh, rod on the piston. Um, and then you put it back in place as you know, just the reverse. Um, like we mentioned, it's important to go ahead and, you know, once you've done that, even if it is just the piston, to recalibrate the test syringe. And to do that, uh, we're going to go to the calibrate test syringe, which is also under settings and service utilities. And mo this is mostly, um, and I think actually, we probably should have closed this first. So we can. Uh, Exit for a moment. Oh, close our oh, and oh yes. So we're just closing that uh, injection port cover before we go back to this. Okay, so now it's closed. Go back to calibrating and test. Syringe. Much of the calibrating of the test syringe is kind of done automatically, although there is a portion that you will need to to do yourself. So we'll go ahead and start it. Basically, it's you know part of what it's doing is pumping air through different flow paths to confirm positioning of that piston in the test syringe so that it's you know during critical times it's not blocking any paths. Um, so it's in the right position during loading and it's in the right position during say cleaning or purging of the cycle or purging of the sample. So that's you know much of this is you do nothing until the end and sort of while that's finishing off, you know, the role that you'll play when you're doing the auto sampler, or sorry, the test syringe calibration is basically confirming that the tip of the piston is at the 100 microliter mark on the Hamilton syringe. And don't be misled by the schematic on the screen. So that's not a real time view of where the piston is. That's basically showing you this is what you want to achieve um, on your actual system. And so uh, it's probably not, it's probably a little difficult to see here, but um, yeah, I don't think it's very clear. But there's a white uh, portion of the piston at the end of the rod. It's the tip of that that you want to hit the 100 microliter 
mark on the test strip. So that's kind of the final part there. So I'll get out of the way and Marina will finish it off. Yes. Okay. So once you notice that it stopped pressurizing, that's when you will come in and you'll need to double check to make sure that the tip of the piston is on the 100 microliter mark. So to do that, you, want, you need to visually like come and take a look. This one's pretty far. So I'm gonna use the controls that are here to move the tip closer. And you have 0.1 and one increments. So just for my, like looking at it at first, it looks kind of far. So I'm gonna move it uh, by one at first. I think I'm gonna change the point one. Move it over a few times. It's still kind of far. Okay. So a few more. And then if you can't really tell if it's there, sometimes I'll go over that line just to see if like the tip will go past it. And then if I know it goes past it, then I know what I had before is usually right on the line. So I'm going to do it a few more times. And maybe once more. Right. And then I am satisfied with where the position that position is at. Excuse me. So I will hit save position. And it will continue to do the rest of the calibration. Yeah, and if it is really hard to see in your lab, either due to your vision or the maybe it's too dark, um, you know, I've in the past used the, the camera on my phone to kind of zoom in. Or if you're sort of OCD and you like to be super accurate, then that works too. <laughs> um, okay, so. So we do see some questions coming in. Um, but since we're getting close to the end, um, I think what we'll do is just keep on and then finish this off shortly. Okay. So you'll know when it's done, because ah, yeah, it'll uh, say calibration complete at the bottom. And so once that's done, you just hit exit. And then you are all set to go. Okay. So just a little bit left. Um, okay, so going back to our software, I just want to point out a couple things. Um, since we're at this uh, setting service utilities portion of the software, there, you know, so we've kind of, you know, just now shown you things that you would do on your own independently without any. Um, you know, need for having a field service engineer present. So that would be the syringe, piston, both on the auto sampler and the test. Um, this would be the O-rings that you can change easily. And obviously you can change out caps on solvent bottles. Um, so those you can all do on your own. Some of the other things that you, you can do, but what you want is to schedule some virtual assistance from one of our field service engineers. And so those would be the things such as um, updating the firmware. So the field service rep would send you um, a file and then you could set up a virtual call and they would sort of step you through how to deal with the firmware. And likewise, if you ever got concerned about um, um, calibrating of switch valves or calibrating of the injection port cover, again, this is something that um, you could do you know, with support from one of the field service engineers if Perhaps you've consulted them and they think that maybe one of your diagnostics failures is coming from this. Then you could set up a quick call with one of the field service engineers and handle that um, remotely. But I will sort of repeat that you know switch valves, although they've been drastically improved, um, you still want to you know have those swapped out at the preventive maintenance that you would do annually. 
Okay, so with that in mind, then the final things that you know are things that you can do is you want to um, even if you've done everything we've talked about and you believe that everything is working well, you still you know you you can't get inside the chip and look at the flow channel and see how things look in there. And even if you don't have a large scale blockage that's causing you to have some sort of diagnostic failures, um, you can have buildup over time, particularly when you're dealing with proteins or antibodies or certain types of um, uh, polymers as well. So you will want to run a Newtonian standard uh, consistently, and that's kind of going to depend, you know, how frequently you do that will depend on what you're testing and how confident you are in your cleaning. So we do have um, customers that will set up, you know, sort of spaced out between their samples and aqueous-based standards so that they can sort of consistently monitor it and it just becomes part of their, their testing um, protocol. Or you could do it independently, um, you know, on separately just setting up some, you know, files to make sure the chip, chip is functioning. And so we're going to kind of switch out now to uh, our analysis software so you can look at sort of what a Newtonian standard, um, the kind of test you would want to do and what the data, good data would look like. Um, so what we have here is, you know, this is our Clarity software and we've imported our Newtonian standard, which has a viscosity of based on the um, certificate of analysis at 14.4. And so what you want to do is you want to do the viscosity as a function of shear rate. So not only are you looking to make sure that the overall value is appropriate and within the 2% specification, but you want to make sure that the behavior is indeed Newtonian. Um, because there's, there are different reasons why you might, um, you know, that this could help you troubleshoot. So sometimes if you do have leaking behind the piston in the test syringe, then you can have this sort of um, unusual, what appears to be non-Newtonian behavior. Um, you know, and there's some other things that perhaps could it could lead you to troubleshoot as well. But you want to look for that overall value within the 2%, and then you want to look for something that is truly Newtonian as a function of shear rate. And also, if you are doing multiple vials, you want to see, is it consistent? So you, you wouldn't want to see this, this uh, rate sweep profile bouncing up and down on the viscosity axis. So it should be consistent within, you know, reasonable error as well. And so that'll help you... Uh, sort of understand how that flow channel is, if it's getting deposits, if it's not, this will sort of, you know, reinforce that that's, everything is okay. And so the final thing is, if you do have some concerns, um, let's go back to the regular software. If you do have some concerns that maybe you're getting some buildup, you know, perhaps maybe not a full clog, but some buildup of some, some troublesome samples, then you can, we, we do um, suggest doing some, um, you know, extra cleaning of the system. So common one for the protein antibody type customers is the enzymatic cleaning. And so that's actually done as a, you would actually put the enzymatic cleaner in a vial, load it as a sample and select a testing protocol. Let's see if we can find it. Um, so we go protocols, measurement. Um, Um, so we'll have some preloaded uh, or pre-installed protocols um, to deal with these enzymatic cleaners. So it's actually under measurement protocols because, uh, as I said, it's loaded as a sample. And then this measurement protocol is going to pump um, specific volume um, into the flow channel, and then it's going to elevate the temperature to 50 C, and then it's going to pause and basically soak that, that flow path for a period of time before then pumping some fresh sample into it and soaking and holding it again. Um, and then once that's finished, it will purge out, and then you would follow up with either your standard buffer cleaning, or perhaps, um, you know, we found that it can be helpful to, you know, during this process of the enzymatic cleaning, rather than following up with a cleaning process where you have prime, your primary solvent as buffer, you can substitute out your primary solvent as a sodium hydroxide solution, with maybe a little sodium chloride. So maybe about 100 millimolar of, of each of those, the sodium hydroxide and sodium chloride um, as a substitute for the primary solvent. 
Um, and then of course, you know, if you are having some trouble uh, with your samples and it doesn't fit into that category of the proteins or antibodies, um, then certainly reach out to us. We've helped some people um, clean out some tricky samples. So for example, we had some um, polysaccharides that we were, you know, potentially building up and we found that we can get those um, cleared out better with, uh, you know, an acidic solution at some elevated temperatures. Um, so we, we're always happy to talk to you if you're struggling and try to work with you to get a cups and cleaning protocol because um, I didn't emphasize so much earlier, but you, you never want to create your own cleaning protocols uh, because that's it's a very involved process. It's not only cleaning all of the flow paths that you see, but all of the flow paths beneath and under the housing that you don't. So if you have trouble, certainly contact us. So I think then um, we've covered everything. So again, we encourage you to have your own sort of standard procedure to, to keep up on the maintenance and to keep an eye on things so that you're constantly on the lookout for any trouble and you know, get ahead of it as soon as possible. Okay, so now we're gonna pop open the questions. Okay, can we scroll up there? Okay, so there's a question about what do we recommend if we start seeing residue around the auto sampler syringe? Um, so in general, just because of the nature of our new um, clean wash port here where we both clean the outside of the syringe and then the inside of the syringe, um, there it is some splashing. So I, I would just sort of recommending wiping it down periodically. It, it tends, um, if you do that, it won't, won't be a huge problem and it, you shouldn't be overly shocked if you do see a little buildup of salts um, because during the cleaning of the outside of the syringe, we can get a little splashing there. Um, can you just, okay, so the next question is, can you just replace the pistons on the test syringe and auto sampler? So I'm assuming that means, you know, every time you do an exchange, you have to exchange the whole package or can you just do one versus the other? So it's going to be dependent on the use counts. So you can change um, just one of the two, either the, the barrel um, of the syringe or the, the piston in both of the parts. Um, so yeah, they have different use counts. So the, the barrels will last longer than the pistons um, on the, both syringes. Okay, so the next question, when we go to higher temperatures, do you see the syringe deteriorate a bit faster? Um, I don't think that the barrel or the glass piece of the syringe deteriorates faster, but we have seen that the tip of the piston, if you do consistently very broad temperature sweeps from say the full range um, from four to 70 C, we, we can see that the, the tip will deform more quickly and you may do, need to keep an eye on that if you do that routinely. Okay, so the next question is about our solvent bottles. Um, so it's saying that, okay, so yes, uh, it's commenting on the size of our solvent bottles. So we have, I think these are 1,000 mils um, or one liter. So yes, these are bigger than what the actual weight sensors will accommodate. And we do this because we, you know, obviously if you have more solvent, then you can go through more samples before you have to refill these bottles. Um, so these are larger than what the weight, weight sensors can handle, as Marina mentioned earlier. If you are interested in um, using larger bottles, then, you know, is obvious based on the size of the weight, set, weight sensors. We do offer, um, it's a little difficult to see uh, because it's hiding behind here, but it's essentially a ledge that you, or a shelf that you sit over top of the weight sensors so that you're not you know, having them teeter there and perhaps fall over. So this ledge will sit over the weight sensors and you can then accommodate up to the one liter bottles. And um, in that case, obviously you have to be able to get through as many more samples without having to refill those or worry about them running out. Okay, so we have a question from someone who's been um, working with their instruments for quite some time. And the question is um, about the vials. So uh, 
So now the, the standard vials that we recommend and we sell to customers and provide with the sort of startup kit are the waters vials. And we don't really have them on hand here at the moment, but these are vials. They're, they're quite different than the vials we initially used with our model one unit, um, which were microliter vials, which were um, basically a, a two-part system where we had a vial plus an insert. Um, and then the waters vials is just a, a glass with the tapering at the base without the insert. Uh, the reason we switched with these is that they were threaded caps. Um, okay, we found one. Uh, so this is a waters vial. This is what we use now. So this, uh, unlike the old ones, is just a single piece. The tapering is built in to the shape of the base of the vial as opposed to having to put an insert in there. Um, so we uh, adopted these for a couple of reasons. One of them is they're very common with our customers for a lot of their other analytical techniques. So it was convenient for them to just use the same vial for this instrument as they would for their others. The other benefit is, is that the, the microliter vials that we used to use, they had a snap cap, um, which was pretty good for particularly aqueous based, but if you were dealing with perhaps uh, organic solvent based, um, maybe not the best. Um, so we found that the threaded cap that comes with the, the waters vials, so these are threaded, was better when we were trying to work with the more volatile organic solvents. And in case you're not sure um, or familiar, the, one of the additional features of the OnePlus is now you can run a whole variety of organic solvents that you couldn't run on the Model 1 um, because the, we sort of eliminated the parts that were susceptible to swelling or degradation from those organic solvents. Okay, so there's a question about if sort of the instrument is going to be dormant for a little while. Um, you know, what solvents do we suggest keeping in the bottles um, during that time? Because there's some concern that if you just use standard um, PBS at the proper concentration, uh, then you can get some bacterial growth over time. Yeah, so if you really think you're not going to be using the instrument for an extended period of time, I would probably. Uh, Yeah, I, I think you could just empty it out um, and sort of sacrifice that, that volume of fluid. The acetone will be fine. You can leave the acetone there. That won't be an issue. Um, Aquet also, because it's you know, a surfactant, um, tends to be okay. But um, if you, it's going to be an extended period of time, even the surfactant solution, I might get a little concerned about uh, growing some bugs. So I would basically empty them out um, and either just reconnect them as empty bottles so you don't get dust getting into the ports here. Or um, I don't know if they come with the kits, but we can provide basically plugs that can plug up these ports if that's going to be an issue for you, if you do have to have a lot of downtime. So yeah, I agree, um, you know, empty bottle would be better than the, the PBS there and just kind of want to sacrifice that up. Okay, so the next question. Um, Okay, so you're asking about, someone's asking about uh, what's included with a service contract, particularly the gold level. So I'm not the best person to ask. So I think what you'd wanna do is reach out to either your field, the field service engineer that you've been working with, or perhaps the sales representative that you work with, and they can certainly clarify everything that is covered there, because um, I tend not to, to get involved with that part of it in the, on our R&D side. Okay, and then there's another question about, you know, when do you need to call the service engineer? Um, so if, you know, you sort of go through what we've discussed um, and you can't, you know, identify what, let's give some examples. So if you're, you're going through the diagnostics that we went over to look for leaks or for clogs, um, what you'll notice is if you, ha if you haven't, um, You'll see this if you at some point in the future do. When you do the routine diagnostics, pre-run diagnostics, if there is a failure, there is going to be a pop-up window that will basically start guiding you as to how to start to address that. Because a lot of the problems you can handle on your own, because what it is is maybe um, one of the fittings on the chip isn't tight. Uh, and you know, you can easily adjust that. Um, 
So if you have a situation where your diagnostics are failing and using the sort of, you know, what the wizard will suggest for you to you know, try to tighten and to address the issue, you can't resolve it in that manner, then of course you'd want to call the field service engineer. If you think that you do have a problem with the switch valve um, and it's not quite time yet for your annual preventative maintenance, then you would want to contact a field service engineer. If you know you need to do one of those additional tasks like um, calibrating of the switch valve, calibrating of the injection port cover or some firmware updates, then you'd want to contact your um, service engineer as well. And of course, if you um, you know have any other sort of significant failures that we didn't really talk about, because there's you know obviously it's a complex instrument, um, things can go wrong and things can fail. So if it's kind of beyond what we just stated um, or anything that might be addressed in the manual, then you know when in doubt you would want to contact them as opposed to trying to deal with it yourself. Okay, so a question you know we did this is we have a question about the caps. Um, on the solvent bottles. So as we mentioned, over time, they do deform. Um, you know, is that covered under the service contract? Again, I'm going to ask, you know, if you can direct that question to your, your sales rep um, to get the, the best answer, because I would just be guessing there. Um, so what is our approach to developing measurement protocols? Um, so I think we're going to um, you know, hold off on going into detail about the measurement protocols. That's kind of something that we'll probably address in a future demo style webinar. So this is sort of part of the webinar series where we're going to do different um, topics focusing on, you know, what you know, to help support our customers in operating our, our instruments here. So we're, we're going to hold off on measurement protocols for um, another time. So the next question, can we get a list of consumables and part numbers to keep in stock? So yes, so when you check in with your um, sales rep or field service rep, um, you can ask them, you know, what would they recommend that you have on hand? So obviously, obviously we'd recommend having say the O-rings, um, the test syringes and the pistons, um, and then, you know, the tools we'd recommend having those on hand so that when they do hit their use counts, then you have them to, to swap out. You don't have to wait, wait to order them and receive them. So you can get that info from sales or field service and sales can then quote you on, on those parts. Okay. So someone's asking about, um, I think FSE, I'm guessing it means field service engineer form for calibration and preventative maintenance used during that annual um, visit. So generally, uh, I would say yes, there is. Um, for something that's preventative maintenance, there is a specific list of items that the field service rep would go through. And so they can go over that with you, um, you know, before and then after the visit as it's completed. So again, check with field service um, when they come to visit you on site and they'll clearly explain to you if you ask what, what they're doing and why. Okay, so there's a question about the minimum volume required in the waters uh, vials. So the specific question is waters split septa low volume vials. So I'm not sure how that might differ from the ones that we um, use here. So the, the ones that we use internally um, almost exclusively and that we recommend to our customers, um, I think these are, I don't remember if it's um, one mil or one and a half mils. Um, so I don't know if you're referring to a, a different uh, um, vial than the one I'm holding and that particular volume. Um, I would recommend that you don't use uh, vials different from what was supplied to you originally with your initial order because the uh, positioning of the needle is already predetermined um, for these particular vials. So it's already programmed to move to the proper position at the base of the vial to load your sample. 
And if you're using something that is going to differ dramatically from the original vials in terms of the tapered portion, um, whether that's the diameter of that or the position of it in the Z direction, you know, you can run into some to some problems um, during loading, not just poor loading, but um, perhaps damage to the auto sampler syringe. So if you want to use files other than what were initially supplied to you, then you'd want to talk to someone here, um, start with field service, and they may direct you to someone else. Um, but you'd definitely not want to do that, deviate um, without, you know, first checking with us and what that would involve doing. Um, I don't have part number off the top of my head, um, but you can get, you know, just like you um, were asking about part numbers for the other consumables, you can get part numbers from your field service or uh, sales rep on the vials that we supply and that if you want to reorder them on your own, what you should request from Waters. Okay, so there's then another question about what enzymatic cleaner do we recommend? Um, our lab has used Turgozyme historically. Okay, so Turgozyme is okay. We used to use Turgozyme exclusively, um, although more recently we've moved on to um, a enzymatic cleaner called Zymit Pro. And again, uh, you can search that uh, on your own. I think it's Z-Y-M-I-T Pro, Zymit Pro. And you can even get a free sample from them. And it's a very large, adequate sample that you could use for, you could probably, you probably, because you need to load so little, you probably wouldn't even use it all up before it expired. So, um, so the benefit of that one is it's already in fluid form. So as you know, Turgozyme is powder, you have to put it into water and it has a, a lifetime. So you have to use it within a certain num um, number of hours before it's no longer um, useful to you. So that's one of the downsides of the Turgozyme. Um, whereas the Zymit Pro, it's already in fluid formulation, and so you don't have to worry about, um, you know, if you wanted to put um, the Zymit at the end of your long sample run, you don't have to worry about it being useless by the time it actually gets to the point of loading it. And the other thing is, um, although just like the um, Turgozyme, they recommend making like a 1% to 2% solution of it, um, we have actually been... Uh, using it full strength in-house for probably three, four years now. And we haven't had any trouble with it degrading any parts or causing any trouble with any components um, along the flow path or in the chip. So if you have a real tricky sample, um, you can even use it at a higher concentration up to full strength. So although, like I said, Turgozyme is you know, something that um, you can still use, just be mindful of its um, lifetime and then also there is a solubility limit, so you can't go uh, above a particular concentration. I can't remember what that is. Um, and so in that case, if you have a tricky buildup, you might need to do multiple um, of the target sign, one after the other. Okay, um, so I guess this is our final question. Do we have any sort of a guide um, to the, that's gonna sort of summarize, you know, features of the instrument and using the instrument? And the answer is we have, um, uh, we're sort of in the process of creating um, what we refer to as a quick start guide. And the first portion of that has been released. Um, and so that would be actually related to uh, prepping your samples and your instrument for measurement. And then we're gonna follow up with the different components of that, ultimately getting sort of a whole uh, group of guides to address the different um, issues that people might have, whether that's the, you know, ultimately the maintenance responsibility one, um, setting up the measurement protocols as someone had just asked about, that will be included. So we're working right now um, to get a sort of um, straightforward guide that you can reference um, to do a lot of things that we're talking about in our demo webinars. Okay, so I think we've gone way over time. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. And certainly, as I mentioned, you know, uh, when in doubt, reach out to, to someone here, you know, depending on what information you need, if you need quotes or part numbers or something of that nature, that would be your sales rep. Also, they can help you with any service contract that you might have. Um, and then of course, any sort of uh, troubleshooting issues, I would guide you, direct you to your field service rep and they'd be happy to help you. Okay, so thanks again for joining. Yeah, and thank you. Um, August is a busy time, so uh, I'll just mention that um, 
in addition to this sort of demo, we're going to have a couple more webinars in August. We have a joint webinar talking about battery fluids later in the month, and then our typical technical webinar that we do at the very end of the month will come uh, on the last Wednesday of August. I don't remember the exact date. Um, we'll be talking about uh, using viscosity to monitor self-assembly, and particularly in surfactant type solutions or proteins that form micelles. So please join us uh, for our other events this month. We've got a lot going on. So thanks everybody, have a good day. Thank you.